Thank you. Um, as one of, I'm sure, probably a number of enigmatologists in the room and uh, those listening in, um, I think I certainly appreciate the, uh, the value of the UDP and UDN. Um, speaking for clinical geneticists, we were all very excited when Bill announced the formation of the UDP in, in 2008. Um, and uh, just some, some thoughts uh, in relation to the, the questions that were posed, um, what components of the UDN clinical evaluation are most important. And I think what was brought up earlier um, about uh, the constraints as clinical geneticists now where we're forced to, you know, bring in a certain number of RVUs and, and see patients. And when I first started in this field, um, you know, we'd see maybe three new patients a week and we could sit and think about them. And now, you know, it's more like at least 12 new patients a week um, who are all, uh, you know, enigmas and have no diagnosis. And we see our patients having gone on diagnostic odysseys and the frustration that they have with that. So clearly the UDP and UDN um, bringing, you know, these multidisciplinary experts together and, and the communication I think is extremely valuable. Um, just having time to sit and, and go over the, the deep phenotyping information that's available and to phenotype at not only the clinical but the cellular level as well, um, determining what uh, tests are appropriate and um, best practices to make the most of the evaluations that um, patients have. Um, there's certainly value in the, the outcome data. Um, I think one thing, um, you know, uh, we're always so excited when we come up with a, a specific diagnosis for a patient, but often on the patient side, you know, I've had experience with, you know, parents saying, well, well now what? You know, what, what's the next step? Um, and to really bring together the, the phenotype and genotype data to, you know, hopefully extend that into, you know, investigating uh, possible treatment, treatment options. Um, the, the modeling cores, um, I think, are extremely important. And then um, I think, you know, uh, now that many of us are doing um, whole exome, whole genome sequencing, um, it's, it's oftentimes those patients that have negative results where you're, you know, certain that it's a genetic condition, but um, looking beyond that into, you know, epigenetic causes as well as the environmental and um, other exposures. Um, so uh, how can the clinical evaluation be optimized um, to ensure that consultants have time to deliberate and improve the diagnostic evaluations? And I think, um, and, and this may be done more often now, but to get to have results of at least a whole exome uh, prior to seeing the patient may be helpful. Um, since it does look like, you know, 50 percent of those who have a diagnosis that's been obtained through whole exome or whole genome sequencing. Um, and then, uh, you know, how much of the evaluations can be done locally um, prior to a patient coming in. Um, I know there's limitations in that. Sometimes the quality of like an MRI might be below what others are expecting. And then should clinical sites have focused areas of clinical expertise? I think, uh, again, oftentimes one of the, uh, the limiting things is the lack of maybe a specialist in one specific area, such as a, a neuroradiologist who's great at reading, you know, uh, brain MRIs for congenital abnormalities versus like, you know, tumors and things like that. To, so to perhaps, you know, leverage that more and, and share those experts. Um, and then also the um, focused areas of expertise among the, the different sites. And um, it, just the, the question that I was going to ask earlier was, um, whether it's possible to sort of, as, as Dr. Lee's presentation brought up with, you know, a patient with uh, disorder of sex development and whether sites can sort of focus on certain areas like that and, and select patients who may have uh, similar findings so that they can, you know, dive deeper into, uh, you know, various specific conditions and, and study those. Thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. And our discussion leader is John Mink. Um, John is professor of, of pediatric neurology, neurology, neuroscience, and pediatrics at the University of Rochester. He's also chief, chief of child neurology. Um, 
He, his clinical, his research interests include Batten's disease and movement disorders in children. And John is also on our council, our NINDS council. John?